You may be seated. Please take your Bibles and turn back to that portion of Scripture that we read just a few moments ago. Exodus chapter 14, looking at verses 15 through 20. We've been studying light in the darkest night, part 7 already. It's amazing how much the Bible says, and that is our only source of real truth, is the Word of God. How much it says about light, and how much it says about darkness. How many very important doctrinal truths are based on hundreds of passages dealing with those two issues. We're looking at verses 15 through 20. Now, so far we've learned 17 things about light in Scripture. We have three more to go before seeing how it all ties together with the plague of darkness, the exodus, the crossing of the Red Sea, and all the things that God does at Mount Sinai as he gives the law which only condemns. It does not exonerate you. It merely condemns you. But grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Quickly, I review them. First, Jesus Christ is the one who is the light that led Israel, guarded Israel, gave darkness to the Egyptians, revealed God to Israel, and he is the one who reveals the Father to us. Second, this is review of all the things we've studied. Second, Jesus himself fulfills the prophecies of bringing light to those who sat in darkness. Third, since Jesus himself is the light, all the references to the Shekinah glory of God speak of him. Fourth, there are two stages to being light in the world. Sage number one, while Jesus was here, he himself was the light of the world. Stage number two, after he went back to heaven, he has called us to reflect his light and to be a light to all those around us as we walk through the darkness of the king of darkness and the kingdom of darkness. He has called us to be lights. Sixth, we are called children of light because a child reflects the character of his father. So if God is your father, you should be reflecting his character. Seventh, while Jesus was on earth, the light of the Shekinah glory was seen in him on the Mount of Transfiguration as he spoke with Moses and Elijah. Number eight, Jesus is the source of spiritual light. And we saw that applied to two different things in the New Testament where it's used both ways, both light in relation to salvation and light in relation to sanctification. Number nine, his light is also the source of our fellowship. As we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. Number ten, light is not only for our salvation, sanctification, and fellowship, it is also what characterizes our spiritual armor. Put on, Paul exhorts, the armor of light. Number eleven, Jesus is our light now, and he will be our light in heaven for all of eternity. Twelfth, Jesus was also in the light of the Shekinah that struck Paul down on the road to Damascus. And we saw that historical uh, narrative in Acts chapter 9, where the Lord speaks to him out of the Shekinah glory that strikes him blind and smacks everybody else on the road. He says, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? He says, Who art thou, Lord? He says, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It was the Shekinah glory that smote him down, and it was Jesus, the resident of the Shekinah glory, that spoke to him. We saw that that is the key issue. Every time Paul gives a long, extended message, he always goes back to that point where God smote him with the Shekinah glory, and Jesus spoke to him out of the Shekinah glory. Thirteen, Jesus is like the light that reaches our eyes and through our eyes illuminates the entire body. Without sight, of course, we've noted that you're crippled, you're handicapped, you're incapable of doing almost anything in general world without some kind of help. Seeing the light lets us enjoy beauty. Being able to see in the light protects you from danger before it reaches you. Seeing in the light lets you help others. Seeing in the light gives you confidence. It overcomes your fears. Spiritual light lets you see the world from the divine perspective. Light lets you plan in advance because you can perceive things that are still far away. And for the believer, the Word of God does all of those things. Seeing in the light of God's Word lets you enjoy true beauty. Being able to see in the light of God's Word protects you from danger before it reaches you. Seeing in the light of God's Word lets you help others. Seeing in the light of God's Word gives you confidence and overcomes fears. Spiritual light from God's Word lets you see the world from the divine perspective. Light from the Bible lets you plan in advance because you can perceive things that are still far away. The entrance of thy words giveth light, giveth understanding to the simple. Number 14. 
When Satan is in control, God makes sure that the earth understands the wickedness of following Satan through judgmental darkness. Now, you know we did a whole series in the past on judgmental darkness. And I think America is entering into judgmental darkness at this point. I think that's why we need to especially pray for our country. Do you love America? I hope you do. If you love America, you're going to pray for it. There are a lot of people that think, oh boy, the election is over now and we've got somebody else that may do something different. You know, they're, they're trying to call recounts of certain votes, spending millions of dollars in certain key states to try to topple the election the other direction. Are you praying for your country? Dear people, I love America. And I pray daily from the depths of my heart because our nation is crumbling from within. Fifteenth, Satan, the so-called God of this world, is a lover of darkness. And his design is that people will not see the light. Sixteen, Satan also tries to imitate light as a false god. Paul says that in 2 Corinthians 11, 14. And no marvel for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. That brings us now to number 18 today. Because Jesus is the light, he is able and he will uncover and judge the hidden things of darkness. Light is a declaration that Jesus is not only the Savior, Jesus is the judge. You see, light exposes things as they really are. And that's what is necessary for a judge to be able to execute righteous judgment. Why do you think they have court trials? And why do you think the attorneys present evidence? And why do you think they argue their cases the way they do? Is so that the judge will have all the light that is available from both sides so that he can make a righteous judgment. Jesus is the righteous judge. The Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5, Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts and then shall every man have praise of God. He emphasizes it again in Ephesians chapter 5 verses 13 and 14. But all things that are reproved are made manifest, get the next three words, by the light. For whatsoever doeth, whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. Jesus is our source of light. But he's the source of light for the believer to live a life of righteousness. Because someday, folks, we will stand before the Bema seat, the judgment seat of Christ. It's not a general resurrection. It's not a general judgment. There is a special time when believers stand for their rewards before Jesus Christ. And our works are going to be revealed. Why did you do what you did? Not just what did you do. Why did you do it? Motives and attitudes are going to come as well as the things you said, the things you thought, the things that you did. Motives and attitudes. A lot of us do what appear to be right things on the surface, but those things were done for the wrong reasons. And God is going to strip back the covering and reveal what's really inside the heart when those things were done. I'm praying by the grace of God to run a good race, to finish my course, to keep the faith. Because Paul says, henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give unto me at that day, and not to me only, but also unto all them that love his appearing. Folks, are you looking for Jesus every day? I sure hope you are. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first, and then we which are alive shall be caught up together with him in the air, and shall we, ever so shall we be with the Lord. We always quote that passage at gravesides 
But do you think about it the rest of the time? Jesus could come while this service is going on. Are you ready? First, are you saved? If you're not saved, you are definitely not ready. But if you're saved, are you living in the flesh? Or are you living for the glory of Jesus Christ? Every ounce of your being, every part of your whole, everything, body, soul, spirit. Are you sold out for Christ? If you're not, you may have some tears. You know there are tears in heaven in the book of Revelation. And they're not wiped away until the end of the millennium. There could be some believers who lived in the flesh, lived for the things of this world, the things of earth, and thought everything was cool because they kept balance and never got the unbelievers upset and they managed to fit in and look like the rest of the world. They talked like them, they sang like them, they did the stuff the other people did and nobody even knew they were a Christian. There's an old question, if you were put on trial for being a Christian, is there enough evidence to convict you? I think for some of us there's not. Well, I got off the topic. Awake, thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. Number 19. Jesus Christ, who is the Creator, John says so in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the what? The light of man. We're talking about light, remember? Jesus is our creator. And as the creator, he made physical light on the first day of creation because it reflects his glory and his character. That's number 19, by the way. In the same way, he gives spiritual light because it reflects his glory and character as well. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. Paul writes, for God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, and that's Jesus who made that command. Remember, that's what John says in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. That's the Shekinah. Shekinah is the Hebrew word. The Shekinah, the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Number 20. That brings us to a recap of the plague of darkness. Now I'm going to try to tie together all the stuff that we've been start uh, that we've been studying all the way from plague number nine all the way down to here because we've seen light and darkness, light and darkness, light and darkness over and over again as we have been going through the text. So I'm going to try to recap that all. All the way from the plague of darkness to the crossing of the Red Sea. The plague of darkness number nine just before the plague of death. And you remember, as we studied back then, we saw that darkness always precedes death. But Jesus conquers death and gives us light. Back in chapter 10, four chapters ago, the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out thine hand toward heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, even darkness which may be felt. Boy, that's thick darkness, if you can feel it. And Moses stretched forth his hand toward heaven, and there was a thick darkness in all the land of Egypt. Three days! How many days was Jesus in the tomb? What covered the face of the earth when Christ cried out? It is finished! Darkness is judgment. Jesus was bearing our sins. The judgment of the Father for our sins came upon him. And there was darkness. For three days, they saw not one another, neither rose any from his place. For three days, but all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. <laughs> God's telling us something, folks. Which side do you want to be on? The side that's going to get the darkness 
and the wrath of God but the side that has the light and the blessing of God I wonder how many of you all can remember the ten plagues in order remember I taught you a budak you know a budak is a, a little thing that enables you by taking the first letter of each word and making a word out of it so that you can remember everything in like a whole sentence or in a whole list do you remember what it was the budak blow fro Life, fly, mubo, halo, daddy. That gives you all ten plagues in order. Blood, frogs, lice, flies, murrain, that's the cattle plague. Boils, hail, locusts, darkness, and death. Thick darkness over all the land of Egypt, which may be felt. And Pharaoh called unto Moses and said, Go ye, serve the Lord. Only let your flocks and herds be stayed. Let your little ones go with you. And Moses said, Thou must also give us sacrifice and burnt offerings, that we may sacrifice unto the Lord our God. Our cattle shall go with us. There shall not a hoof be left behind, for thereof must we take to serve the Lord our God. And we know not what we must serve the Lord with until we come thither. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he would not let them go. And Pharaoh said unto him, Get thee from me, take heed to thyself, see my face no more, for in that day thou seest my face, thou shalt die. Didn't realize that death was the very next plague, but it was not for Moses. It was for Pharaoh's firstborn. And Moses said, Thou hast well spoken, I will see thy face again no more. Now let's tie it to judgment. That was the last point that we made, the new point, and it ties us all the way back to darkness and hell and its relationship to this kind of glory, things that we've studied in the past. We see the hot smoking darkness is what will characterize hell. Hot smoking darkness is also in the Shekinah glory for those who have rejected God's offer of salvation that brought us to the reality of hell. Hell is a real place of darkness, fire and torment, and it lasts forever. With a plague of darkness contrasted with the light that God gave in the Shekinah, God was warning Pharaoh about what was to happen, and it reminded us of some very important things to remember about hell. The devil is not the king of hell. It's the place where he's going to be punished. Hell is where all unbelievers will spend eternity. Hell is where the rebellious fallen angels, the demons, will spend eternity. Hell is where all the people who take the mark of the beast will spend eternity. Hell is where the beast and the false prophet will spend eternity. Hell is totally dark. It's terrifying. It's screaming hot. You know, we've just passed, less than a month ago, the world's celebration of darkness, the demonic celebration of so-called Halloween. But... We have seen God's perspective on darkness and hell. It's no fun, as the devil wants you to believe. And some are here the key points to keep in mind when contrasting biblical light and biblical darkness. Light is the biblical picture of heaven. This is all new, new material if you're taking notes. Light is the biblical picture of heaven. Darkness is the biblical picture of hell. Jesus said, number two, if you have no spiritual fruit in your life, it is proof that you are lost and headed for hell. Because God guarantees that he will bring forth fruit in the life of the true believer. It's on different levels. The upper room discourse in John 14, 15, and 16, Jesus talks about fruit bearing, and he talks about the different levels of fruit bearing. Bearing fruit, bearing more fruit, bearing much fruit. Bearing abiding fruit. If you never see any fruit in your life, because the Holy Spirit will work on you, God takes you as you are, but he doesn't leave you as you are. He will produce fruit in those who are alive spiritually. And the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. God guarantees it. You may not have much, but there will be some. And as you grow in Christ, it will increase. 
Number three, Jesus talked more about hell than he did about heaven. Why? Because he doesn't want you to go there. Number four, the Shekinah glory produced darkness for the Egyptians and light for the Israelites because the Shekinah glory is seen blazing in judgment in the doctrinal epistles in the New Testament. The New Testament tells us three different times that these things were written for our edification upon whom the ends of the world are come. They've written so as examples for us so that we wouldn't fall into the same stupid sins that the Israelites fell into. We have the Bible. We understand who God is according to Scripture. We see his righteousness. We see his judgment against sin. We know what he has declared to be sin. We don't have to guess at it. Number five, our hoarded material possessions will be used in fiery judgment against us. You know, if you spend your time here on earth focused on the things of earth, the Bible calls that covetousness. Colossians 3.5 says covetousness is idolatry. Ephesians 5.5 not only says covetousness is idolatry, but it says the covetous man is an idolater. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Nine of the Ten Commandments are restated in the New Testament. The one about the Sabbath is not. But nine are restated, but with greater emphasis and a different foundation. The Old Testament, it was the law at Sinai. We are not under the law. The New Testament, they are restated on the basis of our relationship with Christ. And a love relationship does not want to hurt the one who is loved. And love is always more powerful than law. Don't put yourself under the law. Get yourself in a right relationship with Christ. And you'll be very sensitive to all the times that you're tempted to sin. And you'll say no because you love Jesus. Very practical. Very practical for the way that you live your life. Love always goes farther than the law requires. The fire of the Shekinah will blaze and consume the earth in the final judgment, so don't hang on to things of earth. The Bible gives Sodomites as a specific illustration of the judgment of hellfire. The book of Revelation portrays Christ as a judge under the image of flaming fire. There are many visible illustrations in the plagues of Revelation that warn the earth that hellfire is coming. Judgment fire is, the power of the, is in the power of the two witnesses during the Great Tribulation period. And as we've noted before, since the two witnesses have power over all plagues and can call down fire from heaven, the two witnesses are probably Moses and Elijah. And Moses, of course, is central in our text. Number nine, the false prophet uses deceitful imitations of God's judging fire to make the world worship the Antichrist. We need to remember that we're involved in a spiritual battle for the hearts and minds of men and women, boys and girls. Satan can empower the Antichrist to perform all the same kinds of miracles performed by the Lord Jesus and all the miracle-working prophets of both the Old and New Testament, but for the purpose of deception. There are three words in the New Testament that are used to describe the miracles of the Antichrist, and those are the same three words that are used of the miracles of Christ, but they are called lying powers, lying signs, lying wonders. Number 10, judgment fires and darkness are seen continuously through the book of Revelation. In fact, seven chapters in a row, chapters 14 through 20. Seven in a row contrast judgment fires and darkness with light. There's one positive use of darkness. <laughs> God uses darkness to protect believers and shut the mouth of the wicked. I hope you're able to be with us on Sunday evenings. We're almost finished with the book of Acts. And as soon as the book of Acts is finished, the Lord willing, we're going to go to the book of Revelation. Because, folks, we are living in the last days. I anticipate the return of Christ very soon. I think it's very exciting. I want to be ready when he comes. And then the earth is in for a terrible time of tribulation. A terrible time of the judgment of God. But we're going to be out of here by the grace of God. So our responsibility is to fulfill the time with all the work that God has given us to do. Redeem the time because the days are evil. 
God blinds the wicked with darkness so that they cannot harm the righteous. There is no return from the darkness of the grave. But by the way, that disproves spirit mediums. Uh, we did a whole series on that in the evening service, as you remember. In the darkness of judgment, there is both horrifying physical pain and excruciating mental agony. We've seen all these things. I'm pulling it together from this entire study over the last four chapters, tying light and darkness together. The Shekinah was darkness also at the giving of the law. Because darkness speaks of curse and judgment and the impossibility of salvation by works. That's why you don't want to be under the, under the law. At the giving of the law on Mount Sinai, do you remember the mountain trembled? Smoke and darkness filled the mountain. Fire came blazing out. Lightning and judgment. And the people were terrified and they ran. And God had told Moses, put, put a, a hedge all the way around the mountain so that because even if an animal touches it, he's going to die. The law speaks of death. But grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Now, essential keys to tying it all together. What was God trying to teach Israel in that startling contrast between light and darkness, at least in three different areas in the text that we've been studying? Number one, the plague of darkness. Two, the crossing of the Red Sea, actually four, at Sinai. And then the same thing keeps going on, we haven't covered it all yet, but goes on for 40 years in the wilderness. God designed darkness in the plague of darkness at Sinai, the Red Sea, and the 40 years of wandering for these purposes. Number one, as a point of reference. God wanted to nail something down in the collective conscience of Israel, bang, bang, like Martin Luther nailed his theses to the door at Wittenberg. Wanted to nail it down so that they would always remember it as a point of reference. Number two, it is a warning memory for Israel whenever they were tempted to sin. A point of reference, a warning memory. It always took them back to the plague of darkness. It took them back to the separation between light and darkness as they're at the edge of the Red Sea. It takes them across the Red Sea as the Shekinah stands between them and the Egyptians stupidly try to follow them into the sea. It's a point of reference. It's a warning. Deuteronomy 4, Only take heed to thyself and keep thy soul diligently, lest thou forget the things which thy eyes have seen, lest they depart from thy heart all the days of thy life, but teach them to thy sons and thy sons' sons. Now, what did God want them especially to remember? It tells you in the next verse. Especially the day thou stoodest before the Lord thy God in Horeb, that's Mount Sinai, when the Lord said unto me, Gather me the people together, and I will make them hear my words, that they may learn to fear me all the days that they shall live upon the earth, and that they may teach their children. Oh, folks. Look at this gigantic auditorium. It seats 1,300 people. Where are the last missing three generations? that they may teach their children. And she came near and stood under the mountain, and the mountain burned with fire under the midst of heaven with darkness and clouds and thick darkness. And the Lord spake unto you out of the midst of the fire. Ye heard the voice of the words, but saw no similitude, only you heard a voice. Reminds you of Paul on the road to Damascus. And he declared unto you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform, even ten commandments, and he wrote them upon two tables of stone. Moses reminded Israel again of the smoking Shekinah glory in chapter 5. Verse 22 and 23, These words the Lord spake unto all your assembly in the mount, out of the midst of the fire of the cloud, and of the thick darkness, with a great voice. And he added no more. And he wrote them on two tables of stone and delivered them unto you. We've just been talking about hell a moment ago. Fire, clouds, darkness, thick darkness. 
And it came to pass when you heard the voice out of the midst of the darkness, for the mountain did burn with fire, that you came near unto me, even all the heads of your tribes and your elders. Joshua reminded the people that it was the impenetrable darkness of the Shekinah that protected Israel when they crossed the Red Sea. The Egyptians couldn't get through it to get to the Israelites. Joshua 24, verse 7. And when they cried unto the Lord, He put darkness between you and the Egyptians and brought the sea upon them and covered them. And your eyes have seen what I have done in Egypt. And ye dwelt in the wilderness a long season. When God brings the darkness of the Shekinah, it is for judgment. Second Samuel 22, verses 10 and 12. He bowed the heavens also. He came down and darkness was under his feet. And he made darkness pavilions round about him, dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. When God brings the light of the Shekinah, it is for blessing. We spent that entire time in the Gospels looking at light. And Jesus, the light of the world, who is our blessing. Darkness shrouds the invisible God so that we will not see him and die. 1 Kings 8.12 Then spake Solomon, the Lord said that he would dwell in the thick darkness. Second Chronicles 6, one. 1 Then Solomon said, The Lord has said unto me that he would dwell in the thick darkness. Do you remember Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim? Darkness was part of the curses of the law on Mount Ebal. For failure to abide by the covenant of the law. Deuteronomy 28, verse 29, Thou shalt grope at noonday as the blind gropeth in darkness, and thou shalt not prosper in thy ways, and thou shalt only be oppressed and spoiled evermore, and no man shall save thee. The thick darkness of the Shekinah was what was seen at Mount Calvary. Three hours, like three days in the tomb, like three days of darkness in Egypt. This was the darkness of judgment of our sins laid on Christ. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. Matthew 27, 45. Mark 15, 33. When the sixth hour was come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. Luke 23, 44. God's making a point. When he tells you something once, he means it. When he tells you twice, you better listen. If he tells you three, three times, he's like hitting you upside the head. It was about the sixth hour. There was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. And then the resurrection. The resurrection was at the begin as the day was beginning to dawn. That's light on the first day of the week. Time is running fast. I got to run faster. As a creation, like the moment of salvation, Jesus brought light out of darkness. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And what's the first thing God said? And God said. Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. We've already seen that passage in John. John chapter 1 verses 1 through 5. Speaking of Jesus, in him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. In hell through all of eternity, there will always be darkness. In heaven throughout all of eternity, there will never be any darkness. There will not be time as we know it in heaven, because there will be nothing to mark the passage of time. Time shall be no more. All 24 hours of the day will be light. No unprofitable downtime and sleep. Time will be done away. We'll never be tired. And to encourage us, God says it twice. Revelation 21, 25 and 22, 5. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. And 22, 5. And there shall be no night there. And they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light. And they shall reign forever and ever. Let me give you the context in the few remaining minutes that we have to the darkness and burning of hell. A beautiful context in Revelation 21. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God and her light was like unto a stone most precious, 
even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal, and had a wall great and high and twelve gates, and the twelve gates, twelve angels, and the names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. That's not allegorical, folks. On the east, three gates. On the north, three gates. On the south, three gates. And on the west, three gates. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and in them the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. And he that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city, and the gates thereof, and the wall thereof. And the city lieth four square, and the length is as large as the breadth. And he measured the city with a reed twelve thousand furlongs. The length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. And he measured the wall thereof, and hundred and forty-four cubits, according to the measure of a man, that is, of the angel. And the building of the wall was of jasper, and the city was pure gold, like unto clear gas, glass. And the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stone. The first foundation was jasper, the second, sapphire, the third, a chalcedony, the fourth, an emerald, the fifth, sardonyx, the sixth, sardius, the seventh, chrysolite, the eighth, beryl, the ninth, a topaz, the tenth, chrysophysis, the eleventh, a jacinth, the twelfth, an amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Every several gate was of one pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold, as it were transparent glass. And I saw no temple therein. For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it. For the glory, that's the Shekinah, that's what we've been talking about, the light of God. The glory of God did lighten it. And the Lamb is the light thereof, Jesus, who appeared to Paul on the road to Damascus. In the midst of the Shekinah, he's the Shekinah dweller. And the nations of them that are saved shall walk in the light of it. And the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day. For there shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie. But they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Are you written there? Do you know it? Have you trusted Christ alone? It's the only way that you will ever see that city. Oh friend. He showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb in the midst of the street of it and on either side of the river was there the tree of life which bare twelve manner of fruits and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And here we recapitulate back to the opening three chapters of Genesis. And there shall be no more curse. But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. At Marilyn's funeral, I talked about how the servants will serve him, and it won't be a dull Mickey Mouse job. It will be something that brings you joy, that maximizes the potential that God has built into your life. Something that you'll be delighted to do for the King of Kings. Something that perfectly fulfills you. Not like earth. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. And here it is again. It's over and over. There shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun. For the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. For the believer, there is no darkness, and there is no night in the presence of God. Only light. And so we've seen the three parallels, light versus darkness, salvation versus damnation, freedom in Christ versus bondage to Satan. 
Oh, I wish we had time to go through the judgments in Revelation. They parallel the ten plagues. Right at the end of the final bold judgments before annihilation of the wicked earth by Christ at the second coming. Note how the bold judgments hit ferociously fast, one right after the other. That's Revelation 16, by the way, if you're taking notes. There's no space between them, as there were in the seal judgments and the trumpet judgments. The bold judgments all occur within the space of one week. The last week of the Great Tribulation, the Lord willing, we'll study that in depth when we get through with Acts. I'm not going to read the whole passage. It's Revelation 16, verses 8 through 16. But remember what we learned with Pharaoh. Darkness precedes death and the fire of testing. Even for us as believers, we're going to have our works tested, but we will be saved, yet so as by fire, the Apostle Paul talks about. You cannot lose your salvation. I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. The Father which gave me is greater than all, and no man can pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Those are the words of Jesus. But our works will be tested. 1 Corinthians 3.13 Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself, sh himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. And so to conclude this part of the series, Light in the Darkest Night, we have to ask the question, are you ready for darkness and death? The Lord willing, I'll once again be in Alabama this week and see Judy's gravestone. Once again, I will be reminded of the shortness of time before we stand before Christ to give an account and have our lives tested by the fire of the Shekinah glory of God. The unbeliever will be cast into fire and darkness for eternity. The believer will have his carnal works burned up or he will receive heavenly rewards that last forever. Dear friend, I pray that you're ready. By the grace of God, I know I am. I'm ready for the light and the joy of heaven. I hope you are too. Gracious Heavenly Father, we love you. We love you. You are so good to us. We only deserve your judgment. But you have given us grace in the face of Jesus Christ, the one who came from heaven to earth, through the incarnation took on human sinless flesh and died as our substitute the substitutionary sacrifice of a lamb without blemish and without spot, verily foreordained before the foundation of the world. He died in our place. Thank you, Father, for giving us life and light through faith in him alone. It's your gift, not our works. We thank you, Father, for Jesus, in Jesus' name. Amen.